Hello, my name is Brian Kennan and I'm a consultant diabetologist at the New Victoria Hospital in Glasgow. And in this module, I've been asked to discuss what is diabetes. So diabetes is defined as a condition in which your blood glucose, also known as blood sugar, is too high. Now it's important to consider that blood glucose is your main source of energy and predominantly comes from the food that you eat. Glucose is really important for maintaining the metabolism throughout your body and it's important that your body tries to regulate it and control it within a given normal range. Now the main hormone which controls your glucose level is called insulin. This is produced by a gland which sits just under your diaphragm called the pancreas and insulin is used to help your body use the glucose from your food to get into your cells so that you can use it for energy. So when would you think about um, diabetes and which type of individual and what sort of presentation would you think that diabetes could be a possibility? Well, the World Health Organization diagnostic criteria would highlight that you should consider a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus if someone presents with one or more of the following features. Excessive thirst, also known as polydipsia. This is because the high blood glucose quite often makes you thirsty and that in turn can cause you to pass lots of urine because lots of glucose in your urine will cause you to pass lots of um, water as well. Um, a classic symptom is also of nocturia and in young children it's worth noting that if they have recurrent bedwetting then this is something that you can consider. So polyuria and polydipsia are classic symptoms of high blood sugar but quite often diabetes might present more insidiously with tiredness or lethargy and can if rapid onset cause weight loss. It can also present with recurrent infections such as thrush or skin infections or commonly urine infection and some individuals may also complain of blurred vision. And again, that's due to what we call the osmotic effect, which is the high glucose affecting the amount of fluid um, in the body and in particular in the lens. And the reassuring thing is that this tends not to be permanent. It's also worth highlighting that many individuals who may have type 2 diabetes may be relatively asymptomatic and not have any of the above symptoms. So how do you diagnose diabetes? Well, it's really important to emphasize that the only way you can diagnose diabetes is with a blood test and a blood glucose laboratory test. And you would diagnose diabetes in somebody who has symptoms if their random blood glucose is 11.1 .1 or higher, if their fasting glucose level is seven millimoles per liter or higher, or if their HbA1c, which is a blood test that measures your average glucose over the last six to eight weeks, is above 48 millimoles per mole. If your HbA1c is elevated between a range of 42 to 47, but not quite high enough to diagnose diabetes, you may have prediabetes. It's important to emphasize that diabetes should not be diagnosed based on a finger prick test because of the potential accuracy issues and it should always be done with a laboratory sample. It's also worth noting that in the absence of symptoms, so somebody who's completely asymptomatic, then you should do two tests at different time points and if both are abnormal, then you would confirm the diagnosis. So what types of diabetes are there? Well, this slide presents what are usually quite um, historical references about the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but you will still sometimes find this cited on websites or in textbooks. Ordinarily, type 1 diabetes would present in under 40s. Often, the textbook would highlight that the patient isn't overweight, although recent evidence highlights that 
at the presentation of type di type 1 diabetes, then the presenting weight is the same as that of the general population. So quite often individuals are either overweight or obese. And the cause of type 1 diabetes is what's called an autoimmune process, whereby antibodies, which usually fight infection, actually destroy the cells in the pancreas called beta cells, which are responsible for producing insulin. We don't know the exact mechanism of why individuals develop type 1 diabetes, but it's postulated that people who do go on to develop type 1 diabetes have a genetic risk, but then often get an environmental trigger. That environmental trigger may be something like a virus, another infection, or a stress response. And the only treatment for type 1 diabetes is insulin, because individuals with type 1 diabetes are completely insulin deficient. Type 2 diabetes, again the textbooks would highlight it mainly presents as you get older. However, with the increase in obesity, we're seeing more and more young people present with type 2 diabetes. In 90% of cases, type 2 diabetes is linked with being overweight or obese. However, it is important that there is some genetic predisposition, such in specific ethnic um, groups, that it's characterised by resistance to insulin and lifestyle factors play a major component. We do know that weight gain and limited physical activity can be contributory risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And in type 2 diabetes, there's recent evidence that with weight loss due to lifestyle intervention, then we can put type 2 diabetes into remission. However, the vast majority of patients need either oral medication or injections of drugs called GLP-1s or indeed insulin. So I've highlighted at the bottom of this slide that it's important to know that historical stereotypes aren't really applicable to type 1 diabetes and it can really present at any age and with any BMI. So although weight and age may help try and identify what type of diabetes, then it's important that um, to consider that type 1 diabetes may present in an older population and indeed in individuals who are overweight or obese. So just to expand on why different types of diabetes present differently and require different treatments, this cartoon in these slides highlight on the left hand side um, a healthy response to food. So food is taken into the stomach. The stomach then absorbs the glucose component of the food. At the same time as the glucose rises, the pancreas produces insulin. And that insulin allows the muscle to use glucose as a fuel. In the middle of the slide, then it highlights what happens in type 1 diabetes. So in type 1 diabetes, the food is still absorbed in the stomach and the glucose passes into the circulation. However, in this instance, the pancreas, and in particular the cells that produce insulin, have been destroyed by the autoimmune process. And therefore, the muscle is unable to use glucose as a fuel and then starts to break down other parts of the body, including fats, causing a buildup of something called ketones. In type 2 diabetes, which is predicted on the right-hand side of the slide, then in this instance, food is absorbed again in the stomach, in particular the glucose. And in type 2 diabetes, there's a problem with insulin resistance. So although there's insulin produced by the pancreas, and in fact, early onset type 2, insulin levels are usually significantly elevated, the body is very resistant to the effects of insulin and therefore blood glucose levels remain high and the body's ability to use that glucose um, becomes impaired. So I'll now consider in this slide how do you treat type, uh, diabetes. Well type 1 diabetes is treated with insulin as I've said and that can be either by multiple injections per day or by an insulin pump. Type 2 diabetes is often treated as I've mentioned with lifestyle and indeed an increased emphasis on lifestyle and weight loss to try and achieve remission at early onset type 2. But the vast majority of patients do require tablets and indeed injections and it's important to remember that type 2 diabetes is potentially a progressive condition. 
In type 1 diabetes, then we monitor glucose levels and if unwell, ketone levels. And it's really important that education centres around individuals understanding how much sugar or glucose or carbohydrate is in different food substances. And in type 1 diabetes, you would adjust your insulin dose depending on what you were eating in terms of carbohydrate and indeed your glucose level. The next slide highlights the complexity of managing type 2 diabetes. So this is the sign guidance around managing type 2 diabetes. And there are several different agents now available to treat type 2 diabetes. The first line agent is over and above lifestyle would be metformin. And more recent guidance has emphasised the importance of considering if individuals are at increased cardiovascular risk or have established cardiovascular disease, heart failure or renal disease, as that will help determine which agent should be used first. I don't intend to go over the different types of agents in more detail, as this will be covered in further presentations, but it is important that you take a person-centred approach to optimising the management of type 2 diabetes, and that you consider not only the efficacy of these agents in reducing blood sugar, but that you determine whether individuals have cardiovascular disease or other conditions, as I've mentioned, whether or not there is benefit particularly cardiovascular benefit from the agents that you use and also whether you're trying to mitigate against the risk of side effects of these agents such as low blood sugar i.e. hypoglycemia or indeed weight gain. So my second last slide would be a very brief overview of why we treat diabetes and the main reason that we treat diabetes is because it's associated with premature mortality and high blood glucose and indeed the consequences of diabetes affect both the small circulation known as microvascular and diabetes is one of the leading causes of blindness in those of working age. It also causes progressive kidney failure and can cause progressive nerve damage which increases the risk of foot ulcers, foot wounds and lower limb amputation and trying to optimise glycemic control has been proven to be beneficial in delaying the onset of complications and indeed trying to reduce the risk of developing any. It's also important to remember that diabetes is a major predictor for macrovascular or large blood vessel damage and in particular heart attacks and strokes and indeed diabetes is one of the leading comorbidities that contributes to these conditions. So again, optimising blood glucose control is important, but as for microvascular complications, it's also important that we try and make sure that we achieve optimal blood glucose, that we consider cholesterol and the use of statins, and indeed that we consider other risk factors such as lifestyle factors such as cigarette smoking. This increased risk of both micro and macrovascular complications also determines the care that individuals with diabetes should receive, um, usually on an annual basis. So this slide outlines the core care processes that someone with diabetes should get. and There are nine main processes of care. These involve looking at glycemic control, an individual's weight, whether they're getting optimal cardiovascular risk factor management, such as blood pressure control, smoking status, and indeed referral to smoking cessation, as well as considering a number eight total cholesterol. There's also screening for microvascular complications, and in particular retinopathy screening, as well as a urinary albumin test. And in addition, we check a blood test to look at an individual's renal function. And finally, we look at somebody's foot risk because that can determine both their micro and macrovascular status. It is worth noting that in individuals who are deemed to be at low risk of developing a foot ulcer or indeed have no evidence of retinopathy, then screening is now every two years rather than every one year. But as a general rule of thumb, most of these clear processes should be uh, carried out annually.
I'd just like to thank you for listening and I hope that this brief presentation has given you an overview of what diabetes is, the different types of diabetes, things you should consider in its management and indeed the care processes that someone should receive given the potential complications that can occur as a result of an individual having diabetes. Thank you for listening.